Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. This is James, and today we're gonna look into chapter 18 of A-level physics, oscillations. And this is the chapter outlined. And first of all, we're gonna talk about what oscillations is in physics. They are repetitive back and forth movement about a central point. To help you to understand the definition better, I've included a few examples. First one, a pendulum swinging, which is one example that I'll be using over and over again when explaining different concepts. A mass bouncing off a spring up and down, a guitar string vibrating, and lastly, a seesaw moving up and down. A few applications of oscillations in real life are timekeeping, musical instruments, communication, and seismology, which will not dive deeper into them. So the two main types of oscillations, one of them is free oscillations, in which they will oscillate on its own after being displaced with no external force, just a pendulum here. If there's no external force like air resistance or someone pushing it, it will move forever at the same pace. Whereas the second type of oscillations is the force oscillations. An example of it would be the seat. You can see that a person need to push the other kid in order for the seesaw to move again. Because oscillations happen at such a fast speed, therefore a few equipments are needed to visualize oscillations. The first one is stroboscope. They flash us like at specific time interval to make fast moving object appears to as if they are moving at slow motion. An alternative solution is that you can use a high speed camera to capture oscillations at an extremely high frame rate and then play them back in slow motion. So here are a few characteristics of an oscillations. First, they will achieve maximum speed when they pass through an equilibrium position. I will talk about it in a while using an example. And they will slow down when they move to extreme position. For example, in a pendulum, they will slow down until they reach the maximum before they change direction, which is the third characteristic of the movement. And they will stop at extreme position before reversing direction. And here are a few examples. For example, the pendulum, they swing fastest at the lowest point, which is the equilibrium position, and they slow down as they reach the highest point. Another example would be a spring mass system. They move fastest when they are in the equilibrium position and slows down as they reach the maximum. And at this point, you might need some imagination to help you imagine how fast and slow they are. But once you get the hang of it, you can understand the following topics easier. One thing you need to know about oscillations is that the displacement time graph of an oscillating system follow a same wave. And some of the key features is that you can see as they reach the maximum displacement, they're going to change direction and move to the opposite maximum displacement. Since we already go through the wave chapter, amplitude period, these are some terms that you have learned and now we can apply them on the oscillations. Another thing about wave is that we also learn about phase and phase difference. Just a recap, phase is the position of a point in an oscillation cycle at a given time, whereas phase difference is how much one oscillation is ahead or behind of one another. So I have a two identical oscillations and they are in a different phase. So there will be questions like calculate the phase difference between the following two oscillations. So to solve that, you do first need to identify what's the period. In other words, what is the time taken for one wave to pass through, which is one oscillation to pass through, and then identify the difference between the two point, which is 1.25, and then use the difference divided by the period multiplied by 360 to find out the phase difference. And that's the fundamentals of oscillations. Now we're going to talk into a specific type of oscillation called simple harmonic motion. It is a special type of oscillations. How special it is? So oscillation means moving back and forth repeatedly, but in SHM, this movement is smooth and it follows a regular pattern, which we'll talk more about it in a while. And the restoring force is always directed towards the equilibrium position. And this restoring force is the force that pull or pushes the object back from the maximum position back to equilibrium position. And then it's proportional to the displacement. So this restoring force gets stronger the further away you move from the center, which is pretty intuitive. So I have an example here that again illustrate how SHM illustrate a sinusoidal pattern. So you can see this little animation here. So some examples of SHM are sound wave and alternating current. They all behave similar to a simple harmonic motion. So not all oscillations are simple. That's why for complex oscillations, sometimes you do have to break it down. So mathematically, any complex oscillation can be broken down into simpler oscillations. This idea is important in sound processing, signal analysis, and engineering. So three requirements for SHM in a mechanical system. 
So the first requirement is that you need to have a mass that oscillates, that can move back. And there is an equilibrium position, which is the point where the net object naturally rests if undisturbed. Lastly, you need to have a restoring force that bring it back. A force must always act to return the object to its equilibrium. So in an SHM, velocity is maximum when the object passes through the equilibrium, and velocity is zero when the object is at the extreme position. Acceleration is greatest at the extreme position because the restoring force is stronger here. So this is just an experiment that you can illustrate SHM. So attach the mass to the spring at an equilibrium position and you pull it down. And at the same time, you put a motion sensor here and use computer software to generate real time graph of displacement, velocity and accelerations, which we'll go through it now. So if you were to carry out the experiment, this is what you will see. The displacement time graph, which is what I showed you earlier. So you have the amplitude, which is the maximum distance from the equilibrium position. It's very similar to what we learned in wave. And it has a sinusoidal shape indicating periodic motion back. And then the period is just how much time it takes for that object to oscillate for one cycle. Whereas the velocity time graph, they have a phase difference of 90 degree. And it means that when the displacement is at maximum, the velocity is actually zero because the object is changing speed at this point here. The velocity reaches its maximum when the mass passes through equilibrium position where it moves the fastest. And then you can find the velocity graph by finding the gradient of the displacement graph, which is something that we learned earlier too. So now we're going to talk about acceleration time graph. It is sinusoidal, but it is always the opposite of the displacement time graph. Remember we say that wherever the object is moving, the force is always acting in the opposite direction. So the acceleration time graph, when you compare it with the displacement time graph, it actually clearly explained that because wherever the force is, there will be acceleration. So if you compare it with the displacement time graph, it's the complete opposite. So it has negative acceleration because the restoring force is pulling the mass back to its equilibrium. And then when the mass is at maximum positive displacement, the acceleration is at its maximum negative value, which is something that I explained earlier. The shape of this graph helps us to understand how the restoring force work continuously to pull the mass back to its equilibrium position. All right, another thing that we need to learn about in SHM is angular frequency. We know that frequency is how many times it oscillates in one second, but in oscillations, we usually use the term angular frequency. So why do we use angular frequency? Normal frequency only tells us how many complete oscillations per cycle, but since the oscillations are connected to circular motion, we use the term angular frequency. And to help you ex understand what angular frequency is, I have this diagram here. You can see that for every single oscillation, one graph here like that, it is actually moving one complete circle. I know it's very hard to illustrate this, but then you can see when there is one sine graph passing through, the purple dot here actually goes through the circle one time. Angular frequency tells us how many radian and oscillation strip through per second. You might not understand why we need it at this point, but later as I introduce more and more equation, you'll know that this is an essential component of every equation. So to calculate angular frequency, just multiply the frequency by two pi, which is one circle. So since f is equal to one over t, you can also rewrite the formula in the following ways. So for example, if a pendulum swing back and forth two times per second, it means its frequency is two hertz and its angular frequency will be two pi times two, which is four pi radian per second. In other words, it's moving off two complete cycle in one second. Now let's have a work example. What is the angular frequency of the following displacement time graph? So from this diagram, you can see that this wave has a frequency of because it complete three cycle in one second. That's why we can just use the formula two pi multiplied by three and we will have gotten six pi radian per second. So in SHM, you will learn two different formulas and the sine and cosine function. I will let you know when to use which in a while, but let's understand each term. The x zero, the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position and the W here stands for angular frequency, something we just learned how to derive it. And T, which is the time elapsed since the motion started. Is it the same for the cosine equation? So you will use the sine equation if the object start at equilibrium position, which means if you have a pendulum, if it start in the middle, then you use the sine equation. Whereas if the object start at maximum displacement, then you will use the cosine graph. We need this equation because we need a mathematical way to predict the position of an object at any given moment. For example, 
the pendulum swinging, mass bouncing, you want to know what displacement it has at a particular time. Let's solve a work example. A mass spring system oscillates with an amplitude of 0.2 meter and angular frequency of pi. At t0, the mass is at maximum displacement. This sentence should give you the clue that you should be using the cause equation because the mass is at its maximum displacement at t equal to and after that you could just substitute all everything that we have the amplitude the angular frequency and also the time you have gotten zero which means it backs to its equilibrium precision equation to help you calculate displacement there's another equation that helps you to identify the accelerations of an object so you can find out the accelerations using the formula negative angular frequency square multiplied by x first it's negative because it will always point towards the equilibrium. So if the it will always be the opposite of the third value, which is the displacement. So angular frequency appears in equation because acceleration is actually the rate of change of velocity. So a high angular frequency means a greater acceleration is proportional. And x is also here, the displacement, because acceleration is also directly proportional to the displacement. If you have a pendulum, if it moves a lot, it means the acceleration is very high. So this is the graph. I will go through it one by one. At x equal to zero, the acceleration is zero. So the slope of this line, which is represented by angular frequency, shows that the higher the frequency, the higher the acceleration. And at maximum displacement, you can see displacement equal to one, the acceleration is actually at its lowest point, which is negative 20. Lastly, the graph is a straight line with a negative slope. It shows the acceleration is directly proportional to displacement, but in the opposite direction. So we have learned the equation for displacement, acceleration. Now there's another equation is for velocity, specifically maximum velocity. So this is the equation that shows that V depends on W and X. Assuming that we are calculating the maximum speed, that's when the displacement is actually equal to zero, it's at the equilibrium position. That's why we substitute zero into the equation. We got this equation that gives us the formula for maximum speed. So, so far you have a lot of formula getting into your head now. Um, so do write it down if you find it hard to remember. So this equation for maximum velocity shows us that the greater the frequency, the greater the maximum speed, and the higher frequency, faster oscillations, meaning greater speed. It also shows us that greater amplitude equal to greater maximum speed. The object travel a long distance in the same time, so it must move faster. Now let's solve a work example on maximum velocity. So the mass oscillate with an amplitude of 0 0.2 and a frequency of 5. Find the maximum speed of the mass. So we're going to use this equation. But be careful not to use 5 hertz as the frequency because W stands for angular frequency, which means you have to multiply 5 by 2 pi here. And then you multiply by the amplitude, you have gotten the result 2 pi, which is 6.28 meter per second. Now, the next part of the lecture, we'll talk about energy transfer in SHM. So energy continuously transfer between potential energy to kinetic and then potential energy again. Of course, at this point, we are assuming that the total mechanical energy remain constant if the system is undone. This is the energy changes. So first, at the highest point, the potential energy is higher and kinetic energy is zero because it's not moving. And then in the middle, Ke is maximum and Pe is zero. And between the maximum position and equilibrium, as the pendulum move up, kinetic energy decreases because it slows down and P increases because it, it is lifted up. So this is the graph that illustrates the relationship between kinetic energy and potential energy. So you can see from the potential energy line, it starts at maximum, decreases to zero when it reaches the equilibrium position and go back up again. And kinetic energy, it starts from zero because it's not moving, increase all the way until it reaches extreme position and then goes back down again. So this is another graph that shows you energy versus displacement. And you can see that for potential energy, it starts at maximum, which is the furthest position from the equilibrium and slowly decrease to equilibrium and then all the way go up again. So far we have learned the equation of kinetic energy, which is half mv square. We have also just learned the formula for maximum velocity. In order to find out the total amount of energy in a system, we could use the point which the object reaches the maximum velocity when the object is at its equilibrium position, because that's when the potential energy is zero, all the energy is in kinetic. So if you want to find out the total energy in a system, you can use kinetic energy at the equilibrium position, because at that point, potential energy is zero. And you can use half mv squared and just substitute the maximum velocity 
into the kinetic energy equation. All right, so far when we talk about oscillations, we assume that there's no resistance, there's no friction. And therefore now I want to introduce a term called damp oscillations. It occurs when the amplitude of an oscillating system decreases due to energy loss. It can be due to friction, air resistance, or internal forces. And instead of decreasing sharply, the amplitude of an oscillation decreases exponentially over time. It reduces by a fixed proportion in each cycle. And the reason is because as the object slows down, the resistive force acting on it also decreases, leading to a gradual reduction in amplitude rather than a sudden stop. Therefore, in SHM, in simple harmonic motion, frequency depends only on system properties like mass and stiffness and is independent of amplitude. Even as this girl here slows down, it's, her frequency will still be the same. He will still jump a number of times before she slows down. What it says here is that frequency is independent of the amplitude. So damping might look like a bad thing, but there are a few ways that it can be useful. For example, in a washing machine, they when the drums spin very rapidly, they might move just without control and destroy your house. That's why there are dampers and shock absorbers that reduce the oscillations. So that's one useful example of damping. Now let's look into the last concept of the day called resonance. It occurs when the object vibrates with maximum amplitude due to a matching external force at its natural frequency. So what does it mean? So first you need to understand that every object has a natural frequency, a tuning force, it produces sound at its natural frequency when struck, and a bridge sways at a certain frequency when the wind blows. If there is an external force that matches this natural frequency, for in this example, the glass has a natural frequency. But if the singer produces a sound matching this frequency, the glass will start vibrating. With enough time and the right volume, the vibration build up, causing the glass to shatter due to excessive amplitude. And for the bridge here as well, if the engineer doesn't design the bridge well, and then everyone just step on the bridge with a frequency that's similar to how we storm on the bridge, then the bridge might collapse. And here's a graph that shows you that when forcing frequency matches an object natural frequency, the amplitude increases significantly. This is why bridges and buildings can collapse if external force match their natural frequency, which is why when designing a building, an engineer will usually have to take this into account. So the role of damping in resonance. Damping reduces amplitude in resonance. If there's light damping, the oscillations grow large before gradually decreasing. But if there's heavy damping, resonance is minimized, preventing excessive oscillations. So a term that you need to understand is critical damping. So this is when the damping force is just enough to bring an oscillation system back to equilibrium. So an example would be the car suspension system. Under damping will cause a lot of bouncing because it can't return to original position. Over damping will slow recovery, while critical damping ensure a smooth and fast return. So an, a graph here shows you what under damping will look like. It takes a long time to back, very bouncy. Over damping is always above the critical damp curve, showing it takes longer to reach equilibrium. Whereas critically damp is just the right amount of damping for a system. Now resonance might sound like a bad thing. Let me show you some useful application. One example is microwave iron. The water molecule mo resonate with microwave radiation, heating food. Musical instrument, they resonate to amplify sound, MRI machine and radio tuning. You can read out the application here. And that's the end for oscillations. Thank you so much for watching. I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.